wait too much longer. I'm going to get started. I'm real pleased tonight to have Clayton Davis with us. Uh, for those of you that don't know him, he's with the Muscle Shows uh, Heritage Area, correct? Yeah. And uh, he has written a thesis on different uniforms of the Union Army during the Civil War, and that thesis is going to be published in a book. And over time, I'm looking forward to seeing that because as you're going to see tonight, you'd be surprised how many different kind of uniforms they have. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you, Clayton. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. So first off, before we get started, I'll just also, also quickly, briefly introduce myself as well. So as you just heard, my name is Clayton Davis. I work for the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area. I am the historic preservationist. So essentially, uh, in any of our, our project areas, I work on historical projects, whether that's, that's actual preservation of structures, interpretation for museum exhibits, whatever it is. It falls on me because we're a small staff, so it's just me. So uh, with that being said, this is based on my master's thesis, as you just heard. Of course, it's, it's not as long because that would take forever. But I've, uh, I've, str I've stretched this one out to about an hour long. I have presented this same topic uh, at a shorter 30-minute segment before, at several other places before. Uh, but this one is going to be a bit more detailed. So I've added some, some extra slides, and I'll talk about some extra topics as part of this presentation as well tonight. So with that being said, let's go ahead and, and jump into it. So as you can see, the topic is on union officers and union modification in the Civil War. So what does modification mean? Well, we're going to jump into that pretty soon. But first, let's start with the basics. This is a very basic, but what's a uniform, right? I think, all, I think we all know intuitively what a uniform is, right? I think you can, you can look at a uniform, you can hear the, the, the word uniform, and you, and, you, and you know what it is. But if, if you really want to, want to start from, from scratch and, and, and get to the bottom of this topic, we need to start with the basic concept of, of what a uniform is. So there's two sociologists, Nathan Joseph and then Nicholas Alex, who wrote a great article called The Uniform, and it's from a sociological perspective. And so for them, the, the big point, the, the big purpose of a uniform is something that suppresses individual behavior and appearance. So essentially, it's meant to provide conformity, right? In an army, you want to have conformity. You want to have a strict hierarchy of junior and senior members. It makes it much easier to manage. It makes it much easier to control. It makes it much easier to function, right? That's the main point. It regulates the group as a source of conformity. It determines who is in and who is out. Who's the in-group and who's the out-group? Who's the enemy? Who's the friend? Who's the, who's, who's the friend? Who's the foe? Etc. But what if it doesn't? So what if the uniform is not uniform? So what if you're wearing a uniform? It's called a uniform. You call it a uniform. I'll call it a uniform, but it's not uniform. All right? It's not cohesive. It's not the same. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't operate the same. It doesn't function the same. Well, that's, well, that's kind of a paradox, isn't it? It's the uniform paradox is what, I, is what I call it. That's not a real term, but that's what I call it. Okay. So just, you know, just, just kind of bear with me on that one. So going forward, we've established this, right? We've established what a uniform is, and we've established that it's a paradox that the uniform is not uniform. It's the entire purpose of a uniform. So based on this concept and going forward, I'm going to establish a few more things about what I mean when I say officer uniform modification. So first of all, an officer in the Civil War, they're going to have their own uniform that, that they've purchased, right? Now, generally, it has to adhere to regulations. That's the idea, right? That's what's intended to happen. There are regulations on book that describe what the uniform looks like, what the ranks look like, what the color of the uniform looks like, the length of the trousers, the, the width of them, all that. There's a, a document that describes all that. But in reality, as we get into it and as we see sources from photographs and from diaries and from, from primary and secondary sources, we see that there are a couple things that modification becomes during the war. It's subjective, it's dynamic, and it's multifaceted. So what, so what does that mean? It's subjective. Uh -oh, does that work? There you go. The pointer works. It's subjective because we cannot know specifically once and for all what that soldier was thinking, what the colonel or the captain or that, that young lieutenant was thinking when he decided to wear a uniform that is not regulation, 
and how he felt about it. Unless he spells it out to us, he writes a letter and he tells us, this is exactly what I think and this is exactly what I thought when I put this uniform on, we can't really know. It's, it's all subjective, right? So let's just get that established very early on, right? So we're all operating off of an estimate and off of evidence, but at the end of the day, we can't know for sure. It's dynamic, it's different, it changes. It changes throughout the war. The uniforms at, at the beginning of the war, non-regulation, modified, are different from uniforms at the end of the war, non-regulation or modified. That's just the result of a war. That's what happens. Supply lines, things change, and it's multifaceted. There are different reasons for why this is the case. There's the material reason. You can't wear a uniform because you don't have it. You don't have the supplies for it. It's pretty simple, and that, that's a big reason, right? You wear a uniform differently because you want to, because you have the freedom to. Who's going to tell a high command general what he can and can't wear at his headquarters? You know, very few people. So there are stages of, of ups and downs when what is acceptable and what is not acceptable change. So we've got something established here. There you go. Thank you. Just say you have to go back to the <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Okay, so with that, with that background out of the way, let's actually jump into the actual content, right? So what are the pre-war regulations and the inspirations? In 1851, so what you're seeing right here, right, this is the regulation U.S. Army uniform in 1851 about, right? There could be some differences because this is, a, this is an artwork, but this is about what you'd see in 1851 if you went back in time and you saw the perfectly ideal uniform as described in all the documents, right? So as you can see, or maybe you've, you've noticed, it's very French-inspired. And there's a reason for that. You know, it's hard to imagine now, maybe, but France was one of the predominant military powers in the world in the 1850s and the 1860s. They were, they were very much renowned for their martial prowess. And what's a big part of emulating the biggest military power? Where well, you want to look like them. That's kind of cool. You, you want to look like that. You want to emulate that style. It's popular. It's a trend. It's trendy. So that's what happens. And the U.S. Army is going to keep this French-influenced uniform uh, up until the Civil War. And in many cases, of course, they keep it throughout the Civil War. You're going to see a French influence all the way throughout. And that, and that doesn't begin to change until we move uh, you know, kind of decades away from this period. 1858, so we're getting closer to the war. It's still pretty, pretty similar. We have a frock coat. The cut, the pattern is about what we'd expect from a Civil War soldier. There are some differences, right? The hat, you know. You don't see this hat as much during the war as you're going to see it when it's obviously first introduced, right? The hardy hat, as it's called. Mm -hmm. Black felt, brimmed hat. So it retains the frock coat, sky blue trousers, the colored facings for, for service, for infantry, for, for, for artillery, or for cavalry. And it introduces the iconic forage cap. So obviously, when you think of the Civil War soldier in the, the Northern Army, in the U.S. Army, you think of the forage cap. You see it everywhere. It's in all the media. It's in all the films. It's in all the books. It's in all the artwork. It's ubiquitous. It's worn all the time. This is when that starts to become part of the U.S. regulation uniform. In 1861, there are a set of new, of new regulations which, which change some of this, but for the most part, because the, the slight differences are so minor, uh, for all intents and purposes, they're about the same. So this is what we're walking into the war with, basically, essentially, with some changes and with some considerations. The war begins. The war begins, and immediately, the U.S. Army is not equipped for this war at all, not even close. The active U.S. Army, the regular army, is about 18,000 active troops right before the war, and that includes officers and men. So, and, and they're spread out all across the western frontier in isolated outposts. It's a very solitary life. They don't encounter a lot of people on any daily, uh, on any given uh, duty, right? They're, they're very much isolated from large parts of the country, from large industrial parts of the country. So we have this small army pre-war, the war starts, and as suddenly you have thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteer soldiers who are joining the military to fight in this war on both sides. 
in the U.S. Army, they cannot meet the regulations for at least a year. For the first year of the war, it's very difficult to meet those regulations for the Quartermaster General's Department to, to requisition all the required fabric to make uniforms the way that they ought to be made, the way that they are said to be made, right, the proper way. Well, what do you have then? If you can't wear a uniform that's regulation, right, you, you get what you can, can, can have your hands on. You get uniform, not uniforms, clothing, that's civilian clothing. Right, you see this term here, slouch hat? It's essentially, say, a cowboy hat, right? Not, not quite, but the same, same general, uh, the same general silhouette of that, tall leather boots, clothing that's very pragmatic, it's durable, it's for, it's, it's for working wear, it's for farming, it's for being outdoors in the sun, it makes sense, right? You're in the army, you wanna have durable clothing, you wanna have a, a durable uniform. The, and they're easy to find. You have soldiers who are stationed in regiments that are, in, that are, are, are training in, in large civilian areas in towns and cities. They have access to these civilian clothes, especially officers. Because remember I mentioned officers, they're finding their own, their own uniforms, right? They're supposed to be finding the uniforms that adhere to the regulations, but as far as finding their own uniform, that's up to them. That's the responsibility of the, of the officer to supply their own uniform, the basics, the essentials. Well, why is it so common to find clothing like this? Well, it's hard to overstate the importance of ready-made clothing. And by ready-made clothing, I mean clothing that you, you can go into the shop, you can pick yourself a pair of trousers, you can pick up a hat, you can pick up a waistcoat or a shirt, you buy it and it's yours. There's no tailoring required. You get it and it's ready to go. Before this, obviously that wasn't the case. You have to have your clothes tailored. You're gonna have your clothes tailored. And that still happens, of course. People wanna have their, their uniforms tailored and they wanna have it more form-fitting. But increasingly, as the war starts, the clothing industry is, be is becoming much more industrialized. By 1860, you see here, over half of all men's clothing that's produced in the North is in New York, in Boston, in Philadelphia, and in Cincinnati. So the idea of modernity, what is modern, what can we do with this new modern way of making clothing, is, becoming to, is starting to become something that is talked about in the North, in, in these urban cities, in these large environments, there are 430 clothing houses in New York alone by the time the war starts. So modern clothing, you know, I mentioned the term modern. What is modernity? What does that mean in the context of the 1860s, in the 1850s? What does that look like? Well, as this ready-made clothing, as this clothing that's, that's, that's it's all finished, you can go pick it up and wear it, is becoming more popular, is becoming more available. We see that the culture is, is turning more towards very plain, very drab, very basic, but well-made clothing, right? Think of a suit. It's a frock coat. Of course, in this period, we're wearing frock coats, but we're wearing it in very drab colors. It's well-made, but it's not very ostentatious. It's not very luxurious. It's not very fancy looking. It doesn't appear to be, to be a sign of wealth or a sign of, of showing off. And that's the idea of what the gentleman should look like, what the professional should look like. An officer is a, is a professional. They're trained to be a professional. They're trained to lead. They're trained to be, in this period especially, they're a gentleman. They're a rank of high social status. And this quote over here is really a great way to look at this entire idea, right? It's that the objects of utility rather than objects of, of ornate ability are the characteristic of American genius. So that's saying, right, that objects that are useful is much more important to us than objects that look good, objects that are, are ornate. But there's, there's, a, there's a pushback to this, and it's almost in the opposite direction. There becomes increasingly in the 1850s, from the early 1850s to the late 1850s, an approach called the age of homespun or an ideology called the age of the homespun. There's a theologian named Horace Bushnell who wrote an, a speech about this age of homespun. And 
or it's really a glamorization of the American past going back to the revolution. And this idea of the homespun goes back to the revolution in the days when to shun British imports of cloth, American patriots would turn to New England flax and this New England flax made for very rough and very coarse clothing. But because it was a domestic product, it was seen as much more patriotic to use this homegrown flax than it was to import anything from Europe. And so this, 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 keeps, this keeps on, this thread continues on, and, it, and it, it, it continues on into the 1850s, where we see it represented here by quotes like, it's an age where housewives made coats for children, sons built stone fences, and millers took an honest toll of rye. So really, it's the beautiful simplicity of nature, right? We're being self-sufficient, we're individuals, we're living rustically, right? It's the way an American should be. So no, we shouldn't embrace this new modern, this new modernity, right? That's betraying who we are. That's sort of the concept that, that's, that's, that's becoming that's coming to light during this period. And so what does that mean for the, 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 the uniforms? Well, I, I talked about something in my thesis now that I'm calling the federal look, right? It's a pattern. It's a template. It's based on, it's based on the regulation uniform, right? It has the same silhouette. It has the same general characteristics. But it's really a template to add on to. It's not a rule, but it is closely followed by officer uniforms from the era. And it stays true for special regiments, such as this French-inspired Zouave, uniform, which incorporates red into the basic federal style, federal regulation uniform. So it follows a concept that the historian Michael Zakim calls virtuous simplicity. And it ties back into what we just talked about, right? That the, the, the American way in the eyes of, of, of those who embrace the new modern way of living, the new modern industrial way, that the most virtuous thing is to be simple but refined. So what's a case study of this? Another example, the Ellsworth cadets. Colonel Elmer Ephraim Ellsworth created his regiment of cadets. And in 1860, they were the champion private military company in the US. They traveled around to different cities and they are said to have performed beautiful and wonderful movements where they, they grouped together and they formed kaleidoscope colors of squares and shapes that melded into one another and they were very renowned for their, their skill in drilling. So the men here, these are the men up front, are of course wearing a much more ornate, a much more ostentatious uniform inspired by the French Zouave. And the officers are again wearing the federal template. Red cap, red rank, a sash, but it's the federal template. And there's a different angle to this too. It's really sort of a, a, a self-feeding cycle throughout the war that not only are officers inspired themselves by civilian styles and by growing industry and by different ways of looking at at life in the northern cities, but officers themselves are inspiring others and are lending their names to articles of clothing. There's the McDowell cap worn by Irving McDowell. It was a very tall cap, almost like a potato sack, and it had a low sloping curved visor. There's the McClellan cap. It's a much shorter version of the regulation forge cap, and instead of, of having a, a welt, it was sewed directly into the crown. The sides of the cap were sewn directly into the crown, which gave it a much more short and jaunty appearance. That's how the sources call it, it's jaunty, a jaunty cap. And then, if you pay attention to the first picture on the, on the title slide, Burnside's hat that he always wore, not, not only did he wear it, but it was adopted by his staff members. So he was famous for wearing this kind of strange looking hat with the crown kind of punched up and the, the brim pulled down. And it was adopted 
very enthusiastically by his, by, by his staff officers who wore the same style as a badge of their membership on his staff, on the general's staff. So this is an example of what I just talked about. McDowell and, and McClellan. So you can see what, what I meant with that low sloping kind of crescent shaped visor and then with McClellan's more short, directly sewn onto the crown, much more well made. A Smithsonian Institution report from 1975 uh, talked about how the non-regulation versus regulation hats were m more favored. The non-regulation style like this was more favored by three to two. So just slightly more popular among officers. Yeah. Yeah, really. So, what does that mean? Just to sum all this up, all the stuff we just talked about, I just threw a lot of stuff at you, okay? But let's sum it up. What are the influences? Ready-made, mass-produced, modern, modern, clothing inspired by those refined, drab, kind of plain civilian styles that are popular among businessmen, among industrialists, those sort of guys. And also the wet methods of wearing the uniform inspired by civilian society and the same ways that a civilian businessman or a civilian politician would dress carries on to the army. And then there's the rustic, there's the homespun. There's work clothes, there's practical clothes that are modified, that are fancied up. A coat that's intended to be a fatigue wear that is tailored and made more elaborate than it was ever meant to be. And then regulation uniform items that are also modified to appear more purposefully worn, more rugged, and more torn up. So, what are some, some examples of that? What are some more examples of that to compare and contrast? On the left here, we've got Colonel Kinsman, the 23rd, 23rd Iowa, wearing a frock coat. That's about what you'd expect from the regulation style. This is about what you'd see for a Civil War period, frock coat, it's buttoned to the throat, it's tailored, it, it fits him well. To the right, Colonel Geddes from the 8th Iowa is wearing it the way any civilian man would wear it. Any businessman, any civilian, oh, well, stand by. <laughs> yeah, all right. Wearing it any way that a civilian gentleman would wear it. The lapel turned back. He's got his tie showing, which, by the way, you're not supposed to have your tie showing. It's a big no no. Big no no in regulations to have your tie showing at all, at any time, if you were an officer. You could get in trouble for it, probably wouldn't. Adolf Metzner from the 32nd Indiana and John Ritter from the 32nd Indiana also. And again, so far away from what you'd expect to see from a captain in a regiment, but they're actually kind of similar, which I thought was kind of interesting. That they're in the same regiment and wearing a similar, a similar ensemble. It's kind of interesting. See, Metzner has got a striped necktie. I believe so. You can't see it up here because it's kind of compressed, but in the original image you can see it. I believe. Yeah, Metzner was a non-com, right? Yeah, it was a, 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 I believe in this picture he's a captain. Metzner was? Okay. At least, I believe so. Okay. Some more captains. We've got Pratt, Russell. This is a sack coat. So this is, so this, this is what I mentioned earlier about fatigue, about fatigue wear. A sack coat the entire purpose of a sack coat is, is, for, is for fatigue duty. That was its original purpose, is to wear as a fatigue duty uniform. You're loading things, you're doing work, you don't want to get your uniform dirty, you wear your, your sack coat. This it's is based on a civilian sack suit. Exactly. So it directly taken from, from civilian clothing, directly taken from it, and adapted for military use. In this case, this is a more typical civilian drab plain sack coat worn by this captain here, and this is a more fancy kind of, kind of luxurious. He's, he's got a pocket added there, and he's got some, 
nice piping around the collar, and it's a much nicer fabric than, than this one is. It, it's much shorter, it's much more fitted. This one is a really great picture. This is Colonel Benjamin L. Simpson, the 9th Maryland Volunteer Infantry. That's him, I believe. And all of his officers. Now, I love this one because you can see the variation. And every single man there, not dressed the same. There's no two who look alike. They got different boots, different coats, different ties, different hats, different styles of hat. Pipes and cigars. Common, of course. <laughs> so, so why does it matter? Who cares? Why does it matter? Right? Why, is, why does talking about boring old uniforms matter? Well, the big conclusion is, right, personal preferences. And there's opposing influence of homespun, of, mo of modernity, of having the ready-made clothing. That affected deeply how Union officers, how U.S. Army officers dressed for the entirety of the war. That parts of both approaches to, to those Army uniforms, both the rugged and that refined, the modern, influenced how the officer class expressed their rank and their personality through clothing. And in short, uniform development and form can give us really important information about the cultural, the social, the material changes across time periods in military history. Because just like today, the men who fought in both sides of the war were no different in terms of what they appreciated. Ultimately, they wanted to look good. If you're an officer, you want to look good. If they had the freedom to do that, then they, they were going to do that. Just like today, we judge people based on what they're wearing. The first thing you see when you see someone is what they're wearing. You, you think you don't, but you do. You see that person, you see what they're wearing, you think about why they're wearing that, you think about where they're from. Maybe it tells you something about their background, their cultural background, their religious background, whatever it may be. It's the first thing you see from anybody you see on the street. And it was no different back then. And so officers understood that. They understood that if you're going to be a gentleman, if you're going to be a professional, you're an officer, you lead, you set the example, you need to look a certain way. And they, they wanted to look a certain way that mattered to them. Not always just the state, not always just the nation, but that mattered to them. Because they had the freedom, and they had the means, and they had the social clout status to do so. Now, I end with a, a quote here that I always like to finish off with, but now I've put it actual, actually put it in the PowerPoint. It's from, from Horace Porter, who was the personal secretary to Grant, and he's writing, writing in 1897 as he recounts the surrender in the courthouse. And he talks about, well, the first thing he talks about is how the officers, the South officers walked into the room, and he says that, that we all walked in quietly, he says softly, he says we walked in softly, and we arranged ourselves about the room, the sides of the room, just as men who are walking into a sick chamber when they expect to find the patient very ill. And then after that, he talks about what Grant and what Lee are wearing. And he says that Grant was wearing a single-breasted single blouse of dark blue flannel. It was unbuttoned in front, showing a waistcoat underneath, with an ordinary pair of top boots, trousers inside, and with no spurs. Boots and portions of his clothes were spattered with mud. He had a worn, a worn pair of thread gloves of a dark yellow color, which he had taken off. His felt sugar loaf, stiff brim hat, was resting on his lap, with no sword, no sash, and a pair of shoulder straps was all there was about him to, to designate his rank. In fact, aside from these, his uniform was that of a private soldier. And then Porter, immediately after, and I didn't put this up here, but immediately after, he says that Grant walked in, and he was wearing a fine uniform of gray wool, with gold tape, with a very beautiful sword, with silver spurs, and that his, all his staff officers looked fantastic, and that they were very regal. And of course, there are, are, material, there are material purposes for this, material reasons for this. 
Porter goes on to say that he thinks that the reason why they look so different is because Lee's staff had had, had their, their baggage train attacked and had to abandon all their clothing. So they had gotten, of course, they got their best uniforms to, to meet Grant at the courthouse. But more so, I use this quote because I, I think it, it's an important note about what I just talked about. What you see about someone, you always see their appearance. And even back then, even in sources, you see all the time that they always mention what someone's wearing. Especially in this case, I think that Porter, I think that Grant himself, I think that Lee all understood the importance of appearing a certain way at this pivotal moment, right? A critical moment in the war. They understood that they had to set an image of themselves that would last forever. Everyone's going to know about this. Everyone in the country is going to know about both Lee and Grant. They're, they're all going to know about it. So it's important to set that example. And they did that throughout the war and in this example by paying close attention to what they're wearing. That's all I got for you.